Uh, hello, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Shazia. I am an ob consultant and a training program director for Saudi ob residency training program in Riyadh for Dr. Suleiman Al Habib Medical Group. Um, uh, the JSM Yuana head, uh, Dr. Elfan Suleiman, is doing a great job indeed um, asking us to uh, do these online lectures and his team is doing a great job. Mr. Furam is doing a great job today. It's Friday. Uh, he is homebound. Um, as you know, everything is closed in Karachi and everything is closed in Riyadh, but we are doing an online session for you. So hope you all will benefit for, from it, inshallah. And maybe you all be protected from Corona and maybe you all stay safe, inshallah. So what we are going to talk about today is obesity and polycystic ovarian syndrome. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is the most common metabolic gynecological condition that affects six out of 10 women during their reproductive lives. So what we are going to talk about is that how it affects the life, what are the symptoms for the PCOS, and how obesity is actually the trigger factor of this whole conundrum of uh, androgen excess, as well as irregularities of menstrual periods, as well as excessive hair fall, as well as um, uh, hirsutism or excessive hair growth, also leading to problems problems with infertility and leading to problems in pregnancy if the person is pregnant. So the next few slides will concentrate upon all these factors. Now uh, let's concentrate on obesity, which is a disease where uh, the patients are discriminated against. There is insufficient and poor quality of care for obese patient. Uh, because they tend to be distributed in different sort of uh, modalities of medicine and there doesn't seem to be one uh, secluded place where all the cause causes can be addressed. There, is, there are limited treatment options for obesity and access to care. Not everybody is privileged enough to uh, see, uh, see obesity centers, state-of-the-art treatment for obesity. Um, less medical treatment is available to the medical staff to understand that every uh, patient who is obese who has polycystic ovarian syndrome uh, has to have a tailored management plan individually. So you cannot have one treatment modality for everybody who is suffering from PCOS. Uh, the World Health Organization has recognized obesity as one of the five most important health concerns worldwide. Um, and obesity is an abnormal and excessive fat accumulation that may impair our health. The BMI or the body mass index is a simple index of weight uh, for height that is used to classify obesity and anybody less than 30 kg per meter square is considered as obese. Uh, there are several world organizations like World Obesity Federation, like the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, like the American Medical Association, Obesity Canada, European Association for the Study of Obesity. Um, all, them, all of them are recognizing now that obesity is a disease and a health issue, a serious health issue. And it's a progressive disease. It uh, sort of affects all your body organs, including the reproductive organs. So that is why it is very important to understand the concept of treating the actual core cause before treating the polycystic ovarian syndrome itself. Um, it's recognized now that there are over 229 plus comorbidities affecting every organ system and medical speciality if a person is obese. So what obesity does in couples is it would increase the risk of infertility in men as well as in female, females in women. Uh, as soon as our body mass index reaches above the 25, uh, the success rate of infertility treatment will also decline, reduce chances of infertility, increase risk of miscarriage, increase risk of gestational diabetes if a person is pregnant. And similarly, azoospermia or oligozoospermia is very common in, in uh, people who are in men who are obese. So let's talk about a few facts and numbers about polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, what, what does it do? It, excessive fa facial hair growth is a very common symptom in most of the girls these days. So 50, or se 50 to 70% will present with hirsutism. About 50% of uh, women will be, will be diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. 30 to 75% of them would be obese or overweight. 
and 50 to 70 percent of them will have insulin resistance. So um, it is very important to understand that all, all of these metabolic syndromes run hand in hand. And out of them, five to 10 percent of these women of reproductive age will have PCOS. So what if, if somebody comes to me with a um, diagnosis of irregular periods, diagnosis of excessive facial hair or excessive thinning of the scalp hair, or and if they have had an ultrasound diagnosis as well as a blood test diagnosis of PCOS, then what the first thing we tell them is not to panic. It is something very common and it is something fixable, not curable, but fixable. So in the next few slides, we will, we will learn what are the things that would be a cause of concern in short term as well as long term health risk, as well as what are the newer modalities of treatment, uh, especially now what we are talking about is that treat the symptoms rather than the disease. So say, for instance, if somebody is coming with hirsutism, treat the hirsutism, treat the obesity, treat the irregular periods, treat the infertility related to polycystic ovarian syndrome. So what you should know about PCOS is um, it affects approximately 5 million women in the US alone, and it is the most common endocrine disorder of the females. Now, what is the exact cause? We, we do not know the exact cause of polycystic ovarian syndrome until now, but what we do know is that lifestyle uh, sedentary lifestyle, family history of uh, first degree or second degree relatives with uh, diabetes and uh, having obesity are some pre predispository factors for polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now, um, also please know that it is the most common cause of female infertility. So if somebody is having difficulty in conceiving, the first thing you would ask from the couple who are trying to have a baby for one year and are unsuccessful is to try to screen them for polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, one in 10 women would be affected with PCOS all over the world. In our part of the region, which is the eastern part of the world, it is very common because of the type of diet that we eat, uh, the, the type of carbohydrates that we cons uh, consume, rice being our staple diet, like biryanis and pulao's and everything. You know, these are the contributory factors of excessive uh, adipose tissue around the lower belly and around the upper belly. And that is the main cause of obesity, hence causing hyperandrogenism or androgen excess in the body. So um, the common symptoms of PCOS would be, as, as we said, excessive hair growth, on the face or on the body, but thinning of the scalp hair at the same time. Irregular menstruation, somebody might not be having periods at all for a couple of months or three months and then having prolonged periods. Um, I always tell my patients who are positive for PCOS that, look, it is not necessary for you to have 12 periods in 12 months. What is necessary is that you look after your lifestyle, keep a good, healthy, balanced uh, diet and try to lose some weight. And if you're having six or seven periods in a year, that would also suffice for your good reproductive health. Uh, male pattern baldness is very common with PCOS, acne and oils, oily skin, poor sleep, uh, probably because of obstructive, obstructive sleep apnea due to obesity, um, and also mood changes, mood changes because of um, uh, depression, because of anxiety about the way a person looks, the way a person feels, uh, jumping up two or three dress sizes, not fitting in the clothes easily, not looking good in her own eyes in comparison to the others in a social event or a get together. So these are the things that we need to address, uh, you know, as a whole. Now, uh, 50 to 70% of women um, of PCO would be resistant to insulin. Now, what is insulin resistance? We have, all of us have a pancreas. Our pancreas is releasing insulin, but in PCOS, that release is being resistant. So how to overcome that resistance is also the key to treatment of the PCOS. And hence, some anti-diabetic drugs are prescribed a lot, uh, you know, in cases of PCOS to make sure that, you know, that sort of conquers the issue of the insulin resistance. However, in the next few slides, we may learn that this may not entirely treat the actual core of the problem, which is obesity. Okay, so... Um, 
First of all, uh, you know, what are the health risks of the PCOS in the longer term? If somebody has PCOS in early life, then it's a red flag for them to be diabetic in later stage after they cross their 40th birthday. They are also prone to heart disease. They would also be prone to endometrial cancer because of excessive growth of the inner lining of the womb because of reduced amount of periods over the time and also depression. So how is PCOS treated? As I said, currently there's no entire cure, but we treat each symptom as it arrives and if it arrives. So it's very important that you take a detailed history. You ask the patient uh, what symptoms they are having. You do the test, which is basically ultrasound and blood test. We will talk about the blood test in the next few slides, which blood tests are, are them. And what we will also talk about, you know, how to address each treatment as we go on. So um, have a look at this ultrasound picture. Um, it, it shows that this, these are the small cysts in the ovaries. This ultrasound is showing one of the ovaries on ultrasound and see one tiny cyst, two tiny cysts, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and three smaller ones over here. So to about 12 tiny cysts being seen on the ovary. So it means that you know each month an ovum try to release, but because of the hormonal imbalance, it does not grow to the proper size to release and hence it fizzles. Then the next month, same. Then the next month, same. Then the next month, same. So when you're seeing this kind of picture, you know that this PCOS is a chronic one. It is more than six to, six to 12 months. So if a person asks you, is my PCOS mild or moderate or is it severe so this is the way of telling them approximately um, this syndrome was originally described years back in 1935 by two gentlemen called Steen and Leventhal so it was initially also called Steen Leventhal syndrome um, and that was a triad of amenorrhea and um, hirsutism and obesity um, now the studies are clear about the fact that if you have PCO, you are at increased risk of type 2 diabetes and obstructive sleep apnea and endometrial cancer. Now I put in this slide uh, intentionally to make sure that there some of the myths of PCOs, we should bust them. Number one is that women with, ch uh, women with children can have PCO and women with PCOS can have children. So if somebody has PCOS, it does not mean that it is automatically assumed that they are infertile. There is treatment available for that and very successfully so. And then also very important thing that finishing of period, which is menopause or having a hysterectomy will not cure the PCOS. It will not. Uh, meaning that the person would still be, even if the period would have stopped, the person would still be susceptible to having type 2 diabetes, having um, heart problem, having cholesterol imbalance or dyslipidemia, and so on. PCOS cannot be cured by diet alone. That is also one very important thing. If a person comes to me, uh, you know, for a treatment of PCOS, I normally tell them that 70, 60 to 70 percent of the cure of PCOS is in your kitchen, in your hand. But it cannot be cured by diet alone. It has to be coupled with exercise which is two to three times per week, as well as medications which the doctor may prescribe. Also, another important thing is lean PCOS. Like not everybody with PCOS would be obese. There are lean PCOS as well. Um, sometimes you go to a gynecologist for irregular period and they would prescribe um, oral contraceptive pills like Diane 35 or anything else other than that. Even if a person is not married, they say that oral contraceptive pill will sort of uh, regularize the period. But again, this is called masking of symptoms. So oral contraceptive pills will only give false hope that the periods are becoming regular, whereas it does not uh, address the underlying um, pathology. Uh, PCOS does not discriminate on the basis of age. Anybody can have it. I am um, um, talking about different uh, age groups, like starting from age 15 to age 50. So, but why PCOS? Because it affects one in 10 women at the reproductive age, because 50 to 80% of women would be suffering from obesity. Now pay attention to this, 50 to 80% of PCOS women would be suffering from obesity. And obesity management should be 
and is the first line treatment for these women. So check, about, check out the global prevalence of obesity, and this is a 2019 figure from all over the world. Um, BMI of excess of 35, BMI between 30 to 35, 25 to 30, 20 to 25, 15 to 20, 10 to 15, and so on. So let's concentrate on 25 to 30, 30 to 35, and so on. And um, basically, these are the world distributory patterns of obesity, global prevalence of obesity. And this is the global prevalence of PCOS. So 14.6% closer to our region that we are dwelling in, and as opposed to 13% in, in um, high-risk countries like America, 8% in the UK, 11.9% uh, in Australia, uh, South America, 8.5%, and so on. The three clinical features of the PCOS that we are talking about is the morphology on ultrasound, that the, cyst, the ovaries have multiple cysts. The other thing is uh, hyperandrogenemia, which is raised androgen hormones or which is raised androgen excess. There are two hormones of the ovary. One is the follicle stimulating hormone or the FSH, and the other one is luteinizing hormone or the LH. The follicle stimulating hormone will rise in the early follicular cycle to supplement, to nourish, and provide nutrients to the follicle which is growing. On day 12, day 13 of the cycle, then the luteinizing hormone will rise, and this will sort of uh, give a final kick to the nurturing follicle, and which it finally gets released. In PCOS, all this does not happen. In the first cycle, where the FSH should be higher than the LH, Instead, the LH is higher, the luteinizing hormone is higher. So it causes a luteal phase defect in the mid-cycle where the mid-cycle surge was supposed to be happen. It does not happen. And hence the uh, follicle does not release and hence ovulation does not happen. This gives rise to irregular periods. This gives rise to androgen excess of uh, male hormones, which is testosterone, so not only uh, secreted by the cortex of the ovary, but also by the adrenal glands above the kidney. And all these things give rise to excessive hair growth on the body and male pattern baldness on the facial scalp hair. And this also, in addition, causes ovulatory dysfunction and menstrual dysfunction. And this is where the person would come to your clinic and say that I'm having irregular periods. Google is very Google search is very, very common these days. Uh, people would search their symptoms, would have a knack of PCOS before they come to your clinic. So you have to be on top of your game with your history taking, with your prescription of uh, the test the hormonal test as well as the ultrasound uh, because always remember if somebody tells you that she had an ultrasound outside and it diagnosed PCOS so you have to break that myth and you have to tell them that um, PCOS cannot be just diagnosed on the basis of a, an ultrasound it has to be supported by evidence of uh, a high LH and a low FSH in the first half of the cycle hence we need to do your lab work in the first half the second or the third day of your period that is. So the diagnostic criteria, uh, there are three diagnostic criterias and um, I put in the Rotterdam criteria and the center, this is the one commonly used, that we should have two of the three criteria required. Number A is the blood test evidence, number two is irregular periods, and number three is the ultrasound picture of polycystic ovaries. There are other institutes which say both criteria required irregular hormones and um, evidence of anovulation. And there is a 2009 androgen excess polycystic ovarian syndrome society, which says number one and number two should be fulfilled. But by and large, we follow the 2003 Rotterdam criteria. Now, let's talk about the hairy horror, the scalp hair fall and the facial hirsutism. So treating the obesity, will not treat the scalp hair fall and will not uh, treat the facial hirsutism. The facial hair, once it is out of the skin, has a cycle of uh, six months and giving any treatment like uh, waxing or shaving 
or uh, threading will not take care of that. So the best way to treat facial hirsutism is by means of laser. Now, again, you have to tell your patients that it is not a permanent cure. So she will still need to go for retouch laser every two to three months. And with um, advance of time, uh, the growth will get stunted to as much as she might need it only once or twice a year. But it takes time and it is not permanent. The second thing is falling of scalp hair, and it is again very common in PCOS. And the treatment of such alopecia is again to treat the androgen excess in the first place, provide hair supplement, provide hair treatment with the help of dermatologists, um, uh, and uh, there are very good results with all those treatments. More recently, there are PRP or platelet-rich plasma treatment for scalp hair that is also giving good results. And minoxidil is a world-renowned, very old, well tried and well tested product for treatment of uh, alopecia related to PCOS as well. Now let's talk about the insulin resistance. Now this is our pancreas. Pancreas release insulin. Insulin is the key, uh, insulin is the key to keep our blood sugars inside our cell, but that is not happening. So that will give rise to all the pathophysiology of PCOS. That in the pituitary gland, the LH will uh, not uh, release on time to the ovaries. The ovaries will not release the hormones on time, and it will cause uh, high hyperinsulinemia and the adipocyte or the fatty cells will get accumulated in the body and this will give rise to excessive hormonal imbalance through the liver as well as through the adrenal gland. So this is sort of a vicious cycle that PCOS gives rise to obesity and obesity in turn gives rise to more PCOS. So you have to cut this cycle somewhere in between so that this can be treated. Now, obesity is seen in approximately 60% of cases, and it amplifies in cases of severe PCOS presentations. And um, PCOS-related obesity is um, greater in countries where there is more carbohydrate consumption, USA inclusive, UK inclusive, Pakistan and India inclusive. Uh, everywhere where there is excessive carb, carb consumption, PCOS will be high on the list in your epidemiology rates. Um, impaired glucose tolerance and diabetes mellitus. The PCOS patients are again more prone to develop uh, diabetes mellitus in later onwards in the life. Such patients, if they are pregnant, are at a higher risk of developing uh, gestational diabetes as well. So if you are suspecting PCOS when you are sending the hormone profile, it's a good idea to extract a full family history. If there are first degree relatives, if you feel that she is obese and um, it's a good idea to check the fasting blood sugar and a hemoglobin A1C. Okay. What about the lipid profile in PCOS? It is now a known fact. Some new, newer events and newer studies have gone into it that 70% of patients with PCOS have abnormal lipid profile or high cholesterol. And cholesterol, as you, as you know, is not good for your arteries. So um, high glycerides and low HDL and cholesterol are often found. And these are the predecessors of heart disease, as we all know. So there is a cardiovascular risk in PCOS. Um, several studies using the Intima media thickness as a surrogate for cardiovascular risk evaluation have shown potential increase in, in risk of heart diseases in women with PCOS. Also coronary artery calcification um, is uh, high in, in cases of patients with PCOS. So all of this needs to be addressed. How would you address this to the patient? that look, you are at a higher risk and you need to look after your heart health, you need to look after your uh, cholesterol, you need to exercise on a regular basis and you need to look after your uh, diet on a daily basis. So it is basically a lifestyle challenge, a lifestyle modification challenge. Sleep apnea and other sleep disorders. Again, because of uh, truncal obesity, because of more obesity around the neck, when you're asleep, you get sleep apnea or obstructive airway disease. So that is the uh, problem, including increased daytime tiredness because you are awake most of the time in the night on multiple occasions, trying to gasp a breath. And then this is um, 
relatively you know common in women especially in their post menopausal stages you know when when there is a little bit more obesity let's talk about body image and quality of life in pcos um there is a um, little study of the psychopathology of women having PCOS in literature. I can tell you uh, with my experience, I had um, an 18 year old girl uh, coming to my clinic. She is studying somewhere in North America and she was here in Riyadh on her holidays. She came with her mammy uh, having irregular periods and excessive weight gain. She said she went to the dorms over there and she's mostly eating unhealthy food and no home cooking. So, um, when, when we diagnosed her with PCOS and we, when we were talking about the goals that we need to achieve in her case, the first thing she told me was that she feels very bad about the way she looks because most of her peers, most of her class fellows are lean girls. So if she's going out with them and she tries to wear a skinny jeans, she looks very bad in, in them. And at most of the time she would try to reason and cancel her social outings just because she is not feeling good about it. Uh, and it hit her, it had hit her hard and she was in tears and, and you could empathize with her where she's coming from. And this is the real ground reality of PCOS that if we are not liking what we are seeing in the mirror, it's our own perception. The others might not be seeing us like that. Or on the other hand, the others might be vocal that, oh my God, you have gained weight or, oh my God, you look fat or, oh my God, what are you doing these days? You know, these kind of sentences should ideally be avoided um, by the society, uh, you know, which, which creates more anxiety and panic amongst such patients. So... Um, Mental health, again, is a very important topic for PCOS. And again, if you address the obesity, you address the mental health as well. Treat the PCOS before pregnancy. The goal is to resolve the hormonal imbalance, restore the menstrual cycle with diet, exercise, prenatal vitamins, supplementations, and good eating habits. Um, if you're a smoker, cut down on smoking. If there's somebody smoking around you, tell them to cut down on smoking as well. The effects of PCOS on pregnancy, I run a daily antenatal clinic five days a week. Um, so I see this a lot. Uh, people who have PCOS have a higher risk of miscarriage in the first trimester. Why? Because their luteinizing hormone is high and excess of LH is a precursor of uh, luteal phase defect, corpus luteal defect, and hence causing a miscarriage because of sick corpus luteum. Such women can also have gestational diabetes in, from the fifth month of pregnancy. Such women are also at increased risk of having um, cesarean delivery because of excessive obesity. So five lifestyle implications of PCOS are infertility, obesity, type two diabetes, mental and psychological problems and cardiovascular diseases. So the first thing the first priority is the diet and exercise. The second priority is medicine. And the third priority can be obesity surgery. Obesity surgery or bariatric surgery is a very good modality to help uh, morbidly obese PCOS patients. Managing PCOS, as I said, please manage the symptoms. If somebody is having infertility related to the, to the defect in the LH surge and the defect in the quality of the egg, so hence clomiphene citrate and metformin or letrozole, these are the medications that are usually commonly prescribed for PCOS patients to induce ovulation or sometimes gonadotrophin injections, a laparoscopic ovarian drilling, and if, if that does not work, resorting to in vitro fertilization. So all these are correct, uh, well-defined, well-acceptable modalities for treatment of PCOS-related infertility. If the BMI is more than 35, and if she is not having enough weight loss, then consider the bariatric surgery. If the BMI is between 30 to 35, then consider ovulation induction after weight loss. So again, as you can see, in the infertility treatment, the weight loss is the key. Weight loss is the key to success for any infertility treatment. 
Now, metformin or glucophage is a diabetic drug. It is prescribed very commonly, very, very highly in cases of type 2 diabetes. Almost everyone takes metformin or glucophage in some way or the other when they are diabetic. So it came to knowledge years and years ago that it can help be helpful in, in fixing the insulin resistance. Remember, we talked about insulin resistance. So that's where your metformin comes into vogue, that it can cure insulin resistance or it can partly be responsible of taking care of the insulin resistance. However, there are some reasons not to take metformin for PCOS on a routine basis. <clears throat> Say, for instance, if somebody is 15 year old, is uh, having irregular periods, what are you going to achieve with fixing her insulin resistance because she's going to have it for long and long. <clears throat> so instead of prescribing metformin to a young patient, advise her to have uh, a watch on her weight and diet instead. Don't pump in any medications in a young, uh, energetic teenager. If somebody is obese and trying to get pregnant, yes, a small role of metformin can give metformin. But please remember, metformin is, uh, can cause neural tube defects and can also cause type 2 uh, diabetes in later onwards in pregnancy. So um, metformin does not cure infertility as a whole. It leads to further insulin resistance if you continue taking metformin. It does not aid in weight loss on a long-term basis. It has got horrible side effects like nausea, vomiting, stomach upset, diarrhea, etc. And its safety of uh, um, metformin in pregnancy is a bit dubious. And please also remember, whoever you are prescribing metformin to in PCOS, metformin till date is not approved by FDA for use in PCOS. <coughs> now let's talk about weight loss. Weight loss will further improve obesity-related complications, and weight loss will also further improve um, uh, further improve the androgen excess, the hirsutism, the menstrual irregularities, etc. So, in a study of morbidly obese PCOS patient, the weight loss was paralleled by a decrease in hirsutism, a decrease in testosterone, dehydroepiandrosterone sulfate, and amelioration of insulin resistance and hence the ovulation was restored. So again, weight loss is a, the key to success of treating symptoms of PCOS. Now, there are a lot of um, obesity treatment guidelines being published all over the world by uh, different uh, societies, by different modalities. So there are AACE, EASO, ENDO, Obesity 2. So all of these are releasing guidelines and all of these guidelines emphasize on one thing is that management of obesity is the key to success for androgen excess. Management of obesity is the key to success for um, long-term lifestyle management. Uh, the clinical management of obesity in terms of BMI, anybody less than, uh, anybody more than 30 BMI, which is here, this one, uh, you can talk to them about diet and physical activity and behavioral therapy as well as medications. Anybody above 35 BMI with comorbidities, surgery is indicated, and then anybody above 14 and above, all we are indicated. So the guidance is, again, a, a large pep talk. These patients cannot be seen on a five minute or a 10 minute uh, gynae OPD. You need to dedicate a good 20, 25 to 30 minutes in the first visit at least to talk to them about their lifestyle modification, their exercise, need for medication, need for any obesity surgery, etc. So let's talk about pharmacological options available for weight management. We have got Orlistat or Xenicol, it's also called Ali. Um, it has unwanted side effect like uh, leakage of uh, uh, fatty stool, you know, undesirable when you're socially up and about and it, it can leak. So it can give transient weight loss, but not a long-term weight loss. Again, Phentyramine, uh, Kismia, Belvik, uh, Mizimba, and Saxenda. All of these are newer modalities for treatment of obesity. And the most important thing is that the mode of action is very important. So if we talk about Saxenda or liraglutide, uh, it's 
suppresses the appetite and it is very easily treating the obesity by suppressing the, obes uh, the appetite. Now, let's talk about appetite in general. Uh, if you meet a PCOS patient, once they are diagnosed, ask them about their eating habit and you will be surprised. And the way you ask them is, okay, tell me what did you eat yesterday? Okay, tell me about your uh, eating pattern in the last week. What did you eat after 10 p.m. in the night? Do you keep any food edibles in your bedroom on, by your bedside or under the bed? What are your staple diets? And you will be surprised to know that most of them have a hunger pang late onset in the evening and they would go to the refrigerator or they would have some, something by their bedside just to gobble up anything. And that is the cause of a vicious cycle of uh, hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. So that appetite, that surge of appetite can be curbed if we are using something which is called appetite suppressant. So that's where the obesity treatment with these medications come into vogue. That instead of using metformin, which is related to fixing of the insulin resistance, you are taking something better than metformin, which is actually suppressing your appetite so you will not eat. And if you will not eat, you will not gain weight. It's as simple as that. Once within a week or two, you start losing weight, Voila, you feel better and, and you continue the treatment. So for metformin, most of the patients will stop taking treatment after one or two weeks because A, they might not see the effect, the desirable effect, and B, the side effect profile is too high. Whereas the, the, the newer medications, they are much better and good effect with them as well. So let's talk about evidence base for liraglutide, three milligram. Liraglutide is a daily injection like metformin is the daily pill, liraglutide is the daily injection. Its actual dose is three milligram. It is injected subcutaneously. It comes in a pre-filled syringe and it, it can be injected anywhere on your body, around the belly, on the thigh, upper arm, anywhere where you can pinch your skin and put it in. It's a once daily human GLP analog and it works. And the science of liraglutide is that it acts on the satiety center. The molecule of this liraglutide, it acts on the satiety center, the POMC CART pathway and the neurons are induced in the, in the GABA receptors of the hypothalamic excess. So liraglutide acts on them and reduces the hunger and increases the satiety. Most of the patients with PCOS who are obese will tell you that I don't know when to stop. I eat and I eat and I eat. I gobble, I gobble, I gobble, and I don't know when to stop. So this is a treatment striking where it is meant to strike. Um, there are vast majority of uh, clinical trial programs with liraglutide 3 milligram. 5,700 subjects were enrolled worldwide, 28 participating countries, 400 trial sites. So there's a lot of data, you know, now available on liraglutide safety, efficacy, as well as proficiency for treatment of symptoms with obesity, with PCOS. So, um, so with the scale 3 trial program, the weight loss across the trial was, was immense. In 56 weeks, 8% of them successfully lost the weight. And the scale of diabetes was taken care of, scale of sleep apnea was taken care of, and pre-diabetes was cured as well. So these are tremendous uh, results that were seen in these trials. Now, what we, what we are now doing with the PCOS is based on the results of these trials, what we did was that we, we made the study available in Saudi Arabia and we recruited polycystic ovarian syndrome patients who are suitable to administer liraglutide. These are injections that are prescribed on a monthly basis and you explain to them how to inject. Initially, on, in the first week, uh, the dose is slightly less. In the second week, the dose is tapered up. And in the third and the fourth week, then the dose is gone to maximum, to three milligram. And then it is maintained on that for six months. And people are losing their BMI left, right, and center. People are losing weight. Their menstrual cycles are coming back uh, to, uh, to regularity without having to prescribe any birth control pills. Uh, they are having a feel-good factor about how they look their uh, hair fall drastically decreases 
etc so all this is very promising results so that is why i thought that i would include liraglutide it's called sexenda um, in in my talk in the last few slides to, to let you know that there are newer treatment modalities available for pcos as well okay so i'm just gonna skip a couple of slides to show you uh, there is no such thing as free lunch. So yes, liraglutide has also some side effect and most of the side effects are related to nausea because it hits the satiety center. So uh, one would expect to feel nauseous, uh, especially in the initial first two to three weeks, which is when the dose is the lightest. And that is the reason why the dose is kept the lightest. So the GI adverse effect were the 93% and the rest of the effect were very, very minimal. This is the dosage of fluoroglutide in the first week, 0.6 milligram, then taper it off up to 1.2, 1.8, 2.4 in week four, and then from week five onwards, three milligram. The dose escalation should be used to reduce the GI symptoms, and um, it should be discontinued if the patient cannot tolerate the three milligram dose. I haven't yet met anybody in the last three years that four years that I've been prescribing liraglutide that have come back saying that I want to stop it because the weight loss is so tremendous with that. And um, also, uh, uh, it should be discontinued if the patient has not lost more than 4% of the baseline body weight at 16 weeks, because there can be poor responder. There are early responders. Most of them are early responders, which is a very good thing, but there can, they can be poor responder as well. So we would normally refer such patients for bariatric surgery, for gastric sleeve or gastric bypass, depending on their BMIs. So um, it's important to remember that, you know, once a person is pregnant um, while they were taking liraglutide, then the liraglutide, like any other medication, needs to be stopped. For breastfeeding, Saxenda, again, should not be used when they are breastfeeding. I do not prescribe Saxenda to breastfeeding mothers at all. I tell them to come back after one year of having a baby once they have stopped the breastfeeding. So our take-home messages for... The PCOS are treat the obesity, lifestyle changes, and learn about recent advances. Thank you very much. I hope you all like this lecture. And I would like to thank uh, GSM Ioana for uh, initiating these educational activities for the students uh, and wish you all the very best. Thank you very much. <laughs>